can, so I'll say this tongue in cheek. But Shannon Kay doesn't have to take notes on my story. She is my story. And um, I wouldn't be who I am without her. And so I'm thankful that she's able to be here and our two youngest daughters as well. You don't, you don't get to see what, what we see and, and what we're trying to tell you today. So I'll, I'll just go through this just briefly and tell you who I am. Um, I grew up in a preacher's family. My dad started preaching when I was in third grade. So from the time that I was in first grade, he was in preaching school and then um, preaching, moving around, uh, meeting brethren in, and really in parts of Tennessee and Mississippi. Um, and so my, my, I don't have home necessarily. In fact, I've lived longer in our home in San Marcos in the past 10 and a half years than I've lived in any place of my life. And so it's as close to home as, as we have. And uh, I'll, I'll make mention of that at, at the end in my advice uh, and encouragement to you um, as the older people of this congregation because you are a vital part of the preacher's life, whether you realize it or not. And, and I hope that you do realize it. Um, grew up in North Mississippi, um, mostly. Um, just just a, a couple of couple of stories to tell you my story. Um, my dad was a member of the church. My mom was not when they were uh, dating and first married. My dad fell away, and we lived in the country. If you've ever used the term mid- redneck and Mississippi together, you've not been wrong. It's true. <laughs> it's real. Um, my, my grandparents lived in a trailer house here, my aunt and uncle in a trailer house here, and we lived in one here, and there was nobody else for miles around. It, it, it was backwoods, and um, my dad worked for a truck line in Memphis, and it snowed that night, and ice on the road, so my other grandparents came to get us. They didn't want us to have to travel in, in the snow the next day, the rain, and, and, and slush, and so they came to get us. While we were gone that night, our trailer blew up, and my other grandfather and uncle thought we were in there and they went through trying to find us and uh, but as a result my parents took the insurance money and moved us to the city and uh, we moved to South Haven Mississippi where I ended up preaching for six years a little bit later on in life still weren't faithful to the church but South Haven had a bus ministry and they would come the joy bus would come through the neighborhoods and pick the kids up mom and dad knew we needed to be in Bible class and so they sent us and it was an outreach, so they got our name and address, and visitation program there at South Haven restored my parents to the church. And my dad was so grateful for the work that they did, he wanted to be a part of the visitation program. That meant he had to give devotionals and write lessons, and he loved it and enjoyed it. And so from that, he decided a couple of years later he wanted to preach the gospel. And so as a result of something that was tragic, um, the Lord worked and blessed our lives. The second uh, story, when I was a junior in high school, I became very close friends with a couple of guys who were already attending the Memphis School of Preaching. We only lived 30 minutes away. And uh, one of those, a couple of those guys were Dave Leonard and Cliff Goodwin. You may have heard the, those guys preach before, heard their names. Um, but we would hang out every Thursday. In fact, I, I skipped a lot of Fridays in high school my junior year because I'd just stay in Memphis with them overnight. So I went and I begged my mom and dad, can you please let me skip my senior year of high school? I'll, I'll do uh, summer courses to get my degree, to get my, my d diploma, and I'll finish. I just want to go to preaching school while these guys are still there. And so they allowed me to do that. And uh, in the incoming class, I was the youngest guy. I was 17 years old. In the incoming class, there was the oldest man, and he was a man coming from Texas who had a 16-year-old daughter. And... Shana Kay and I dated for the two years that her father and I were classmates in Memphis and got married just after that. Again, I would be like Mordecai to say, I don't know the Lord's hand, and I would never profess to proclaim to know where his providence always works. But he blessed me in those two isolated ideas and thoughts to make me who I am today. And uh, if you want to know my story, that's it. That, that's, that's, that's my life. Um, and... I was thinking in Steve's lesson last night, you know, why me? That comes to mind a whole lot for me. Um, and I ask here to, to mention your hobbies. I don't have any hobbies. I've got four daughters. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have any hobbies or extra money or anything. To, even if I had time for hobbies, there's no money for hobbies. Um, and, and my favorite memories, whether that's growing up, or, and I don't know where, what the question would be, growing up or now, 
now it's obviously my girls. Um, we had a, 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 a family at South Haven that while we were there that had three daughters and we had Bailey while we were there so we had our third daughter there. And of course everybody always asks you, don't you want a boy? You're going to keep trying for a boy? Don't you want a boy? And, and that, that older man who's now passed on told me, he said, you have a son until he gets married and you have a daughter for life. They will take care of you. And I'm already experiencing that. Our oldest daughter is at Southwest and I get the opportunity to teach her there in the school uh, two mornings uh, a week, Tuesday and Thursday morning. And it is the um, best life I could ever describe to you. And so I stand as someone highly indebted to God and humbled by the grace he's given me in life. My favorite scriptures, um, I often tell the students when we're studying, the book that we're studying currently is my favorite book because it seems to happen that way. But there's a passage that several years ago I, I found, I, I'm sure I had read it before, but I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. Maybe it meant more as I got a little older. But Psalm 71 and verse 18 says, Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until... I declare your strength to this generation. And it is my prayer every morning that the Lord allow me that opportunity. And it has become my favorite passage in Scripture because it gives me a purpose for getting up every morning. It gives me a drive and desire every day uh, to, to move forward. Um, my, my encouragement to you. I've mentioned South Haven a couple of times. Brother Keith Moser was the local preacher there. Um, when, when we were, were, were young, uh, when I was, before my dad started preaching and while my dad was in preaching school. And it came full circle that five years after I started preaching, the associate position came open to, to move back there. And I did. And I worked there for six years. And um, one of the greatest benefits and blessings of that six-year period of time was every Wednesday morning, I taught a class just like this. Uh, first, and BJ and I swapped out um, that class, and then eventually I just became the, the full-time teacher in there, um, fit everybody's schedule better. And I have some of the dearest friendships in the world today because of that Wednesday morning class. We would, we would go to lunch every other week or so, and there was a, one particular gentleman that we would go with, I would go with every week just about, and they gave us a place to belong as a younger family. I was 23 when we started working there. And um, as a preacher, and I say this because of our, you know, my, my living in San Marcos longer than anywhere of my life, I don't know that any, everyone appreciates this, and I don't know that you can't appreciate it unless you're a preacher, but you don't have blood family most of the time where you live and preach. You don't. I mean, mo most people get to get to at least somewhat choose where they're going to preach and where they're going to live, where they're going to live, where they're going to work. If they want to stay close to mom and dad, they can. If they want to cl stay close to brothers and sisters, they can. But preachers, they don't have that luxury. They don't, they don't get that, that privilege. And so the church becomes their family, not just their spiritual family. It becomes their physical family. It becomes the people that they eat with and they, and, and they go to ball games with and they, they converse with. They don't have mom and dad. My dad's eight hours away and that's the closest we've been in a long time and we're eight hours away from one another and so my, my encouragement to you would be to to do your best try your hardest to make your preachers I know you've got two younger families here working with you and I, I respect and love both of these men more than I have time to tell you in, in this setting they have unique talents and abilities and I love them um, make them part of your family not just the church family as a whole, shaking their hand, hugging their neck, but literally a part of your family. Treat them like you would your children or your grandchildren. And, and that relationship that you have with them will last. I've gone back to do a number of funerals, and those individuals in that Wednesday morning class have had preachers. They, they, they've, outlived, they've outlived a lot of us, and so they, they have preachers a mile long the list to do their funerals. But that relationship I made in those six years in that Wednesday morning class changed my life, and I hope it changed theirs. And I know it can for you if you'll, if you'll do that. And I know these, these guys will appreciate it as well. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and look forward to what these gentlemen have to say. Thank you, sir. I think I got it.
Come on, okay. Well, good morning. Um, good to good to see so many so many faces. Um, thankful for the opportunity, Tim, to maybe share with you all some thoughts as it pertains to my, pertains to myself as well as some encouraging words. I don't have a lot to say about me. I grew up in the state of Mississippi. Um, growing up, um, I was one. I was a normal boy. I liked playing under the houses. Uh, we spent several several hours in the woods. Um, as if I didn't mention, I'm from South Mississippi, and um, so I was um, just an old country boy. Um, I grew up, um, ended up going to the army. Never had the desire to preach. Um, as I as I progressed progressed in age, around the age of 18, I had my first encounter with the church. Um, I was a class was set up for myself, and I immediately obeyed. Um, not very faithful over the years, um, and I say that in this in this light, I didn't commit myself to the church. I was I was faithful in attendance, but not was faithful to the church and being actively engaged. Um, life after prior after after my years in the army, um, Hurricane Satan tend to came have come my way, and um, troubles arose in life, and it brought me to the book. And I began teaching, I began preaching, and I wanted to become better at it. So I decided to make a journey to Texas and come to school, and I ended up finding Brown Trail. And um, for me, that is probably one of the, the better memories outside coming in contact with the gospel that I have. Um, those two years cannot, cannot, be, cannot be compared to much other than that. Um, they were very, very helpful to me. My family, as I know and I'm aware of, the only member, the only individual in my blood family that is a member of the church is myself, with the exception of my, of my children. Um, other than that, I know, of any, I know of no one else who's members of the church. My hobbies, I don't like, like Wayne, I don't have any. Um, we preachers, we don't tend to have many hobbies. However, my, I, I, I've always liked dogs. And I was finally able to convince my wife here a few months ago to let me, let me buy a Rottweiler. I like, I like Rottweilers. So, so a lot of time is spent with her. <laughs> um, she, she likes attention. So that, that's what I do. Um, favorite scriptures. Um, mine would have to be, as, and, and Wayne just gave me another one, and it actually goes with mine. Um, in Ezra chapter 7, um, verses 6 and 10 are two of my favorite, if you'll go there with me. Ezra, chapter 7, verses 6 and 10. <clears throat> i let everybody get there before I read them. And it says, this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was, the King James says, he was a ready scribe in the law of God, or rather in the law of Moses. Um, he had equipped himself. We see that in verse number 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach it in Israel, statutes, and judgments. In a day when a man of God was needed, um, this man readied himself. Um, to be God's spokesman, to stand on the earth in God's stead. Um, he applied himself, he diligently studied, and with that he became an effective citizen in God's kingdom. And when I began to look at that verse and look at the book overall, that, those verses for me, I admire and they are challenging. And as men of God, we stand as God's spokesman, as, God, as God's representative, and we must be consumed with God's word, and this was the case with Ezra. So for me, that is my favorite, two of my favorite passages of, of scripture. And as far as words of encouragement to the seniors, call your attention to Judges 2, if you go there with me real quick. Judges 2. And we consider verse number 10. Let 
The text reads, And also all their generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done in Israel. As those of you who are seniors and whose, in the overall scheme of things, a little closer to the grave than some of us younger people are, um, there's a generation that will follow you. Um, your grandchildren, your children, um, coming up in generations previously, uh, uh, behind you. The best thing we can do for our generations behind us is to ready them, is to go back and visualize the, the teachings of God through Moses in Deuteronomy 6 and equip those who we will leave. Uh, we are very aware of the, the condition of the world in which we live in, um, and we still have a divine responsibility to, to saturate the world with righteousness. Um, may we not leave our families unprepared for the things that are coming, um, the things that we are now facing. So the best, thing, the best thing that we can do as the elder generation is ready our families, um, establish the influence, establish them in the way of heaven, establish them in the word. So that when we depart, uh, we can leave them in a situation where that tradition can hopefully continue. Remember the words of Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, to the thing that you've seen and heard in me among many witnesses. Commit these things to faithful men that they may be able to teach others also. We see the perpetual nature of the word of God. That's the best thing we can do for those that follow us. Continue to keep the word being saturated in our hearts, which will ultimately have an effect on the world around us. We know the Bible in Proverbs 14, 34. Um, righteousness will exalt the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. If we want to eradicate sin, or at least do all we can to try to do that, let us plague the world with righteousness. So we ready ourselves, we ready those whom we love, and we seek to ready the world. Um, as we know our time comes to an end on this side, may our influence precede us as we go on and take our journey into eternity. Thank you, sir. Well, I'll, I'll start off this morning by saying three numbers. Six, twelve, and nine. The first number, six, is the times that we moved growing up. My father was not a Christian, is not a member of the Lord's Church. My mother was not faithful uh, when I was born. And I have three other brothers. And because of many times turmoil in their relationship, we would move. They would separate and then move back together. And so from third grade, fourth grade, sixth grade, <laughs> and ninth grade, those are the major moves that I can make. And I'm not talking about like cross town. I'm talking about California, Oklahoma, back to St. Louis, uh, where I am from originally. Those have an effect on you when you move around a lot. You don't build long-term relationships. You don't make a lot of long-term friends. You're always the new person in school, always getting to know new teachers and, and new environments. It gave me the ability to be versatile and to try and listen and get to know people because you don't have that reputation to go on and say, oh, well, you've always known me. No, we are new in our relationships. The number 12 is a number of broken bones that I had from five years old until 16. My poor mama. <laughs> uh, so at five years old, broke this wrist. Broke it again at seven in two places. Uh, then at 12, I was hit by a car, broke all the bones in my ankle. At 13, playing football, I broke this ankle, the right side. Playing basketball, broke three fingers. Broke about four fingers doing things I had no business doing. <laughs> broke two fingers on a bike, and then it just stopped, thankfully. <laughs> thankfully, because when I wanted to play football, my mom was like, no. Nope. <laughs> Absolutely not. So number nine is uh, ninth grade. That was probably the biggest impact of my life at the time because uh, 
that was the most stable time period. We were in one place in St. Louis from middle school on. But in ninth grade, I got an opportunity to go to a very new school in St. Louis, a magnet school, and it was the Cleveland Junior Naval Academy. It was run by the Navy under the Naval Junior ROTC program. And it was going to be unique because there was no other school like it at the time in the country where all of the school was ROTC, it wasn't just a class. So we wore uniforms every day and it was conducted very strictly just like a private military academy. So that was a blessing because I came from a very poor part of St. Louis and the, the neighborhood high school that I would have been zoned for was really not uh, academically strong. Um, a lot of problems there, of course, social problems, a lot of violence just from the environment that many of the students came from. So I lived there in St. Louis up until I graduated high school. Family. Um, the first thing I would mention is that uh, my father is not active now, but at the time growing up, he was a member of the Nation of Islam. I don't know how much you know about the Muslim religion, but there are about six major divisions or sects, just like Pharisees, Sadducees, the Zealots, the Essenes. In the nation, in, in Islam, there are the Sunni Muslims, there are the Shiites that we think of as Eastern Islam, and then here in America, there's the American Muslim Mission, there's the Nation of Islam, and then there's also American uh, Muslim society. So at the time that my father was growing up, of the Islamic religions, it's been flipped. The one that most people in society saw as anti-society and anti-America was the Nation of Islam, and that the Eastern Islamic religion was the safer one. They were more peaceful. Now it's the opposite, <laughs> that the Eastern Islamic religion is seen as the most dangerous, and in some ways fairly so. But the Nation of Islam, the American Muslims, are seen as more uh, mainstream. I say that to say this because it helped me to understand about devotion. One thing about Islam is that the members of it that are devoted are very dedicated. They do not eat pork, they do not drink coffee, they do not eat chocolate, they are very disciplined. The women sit on one side, men sit on the other. The regime, the, the, the routine of praying five times a day, uh, of so many things in your life, the dietary restrictions, the uh, physical restrictions that are placed upon Muslims, but they all just have the image of spirituality. It is so akin to the Old Testament and the law of Judaism that they relied on those dietary restrictions and those physical restrictions to see themselves as closer to God. But it helped to open my mind to the Bible because when I was 12 years old, my mother was restored and she was uh, she returned to faithfulness to the Church of Christ. Now, before that time, we'd never been to any church at all. My mother was just of the mindset, I guess, at the time that we're not going to go back to the Lord's Church. She wasn't going to go anywhere else. And St. Louis is a very Catholic area, huge. One of the third largest basilicas cathedral in the U.S. is in St. Louis, a huge Catholic area. But this is my first introduction to the Bible. I had, I had no real clue about it. Of course, I had read parts of the Quran, but no introduction to the Bible. But I learned from this uh, that my Aunt Vera, which is my great-great-aunt, my great-grandmother, Annie Lee Martin, and my grandmother, Fanny Watson, were all members of the Lord's Church. And you say, well, how did all this time you were disconnected? Well, I was in St. Louis and they were in Oklahoma City. And we only went there maybe, I can remember probably four or five times growing up. So we were really disconnected. But upon graduating high school, uh, my mother and father divorced. She moved to Oklahoma City and she was faithful and has been faithful now 30 years since then. But it was a blessing because I built a relationship with my great grandmother, especially my great aunt. Uh, who was very dedicated and, and very knowledgeable in the Bible, and I would go and sit with her and talk with her, and, and she really instilled in me a love for the Bible. Although I did not obey the gospel, just the things that uh, I guess I experienced growing up, and then my life, of course, graduating high school, I went on to the Army and other things in life. And around 1990, after I was deployed to uh, Germany for Desert Storm, I returned and I was really curious about the Bible. I wanted purpose in my life. And so we think about family, um, that connection with my grandparents really made the difference. 
and meeting someone that loved the Bible, which we'll talk about in just a second. I have four brothers, two live in Texas, one lives in uh, New York City, um, and uh, we are fairly close. Uh, we were very close growing up. They are not members of the Lord's church, and so that, unfortunately, is a factor that keeps us somewhat distant uh, because of my lifestyle as a Christian and their lifestyle as non-Christians are not necessarily congruent. Hobbies. Now, I'm going to say this. I don't know why preachers want to get them and say, I don't have any hobbies. I got kids. Kids are not a hobby, brother. <laughs> hobbies are for getting away from kids. <laughs> And so I'm going to tell you right now, I got some hobbies. <laughs> and this is the reason I want to say this uh, to, to everyone, elders, deacons, preachers here. A couple of years ago, one of the things about preaching in the local work here in Texas is a, I, I'm blessed to be able to preach full time. When I first started preaching, when I first graduated Memphis School of Preaching in Chattanooga, I worked. I worked half time. Um, and I preached and I worked nights uh, and it's very difficult it's very difficult to do that and really commit yourself to preaching I always felt I was kind of like in the middle of both not really working <laughs> not really preaching just there and uh, you know God has a plan for you of course that's not my plan my plan was I left a career I had a good job but I really wanted to preach I went to a school of preaching and then came to graduation everyone has a place to preach I didn't <laughs> And thankfully, at least at that time, they don't do it anymore now. But they let me stay on through the second summer session until we were able to find a local work. And uh, so I had to work and preach. And, but, you know, God always has a plan. It just happened that I would be in Chattanooga. It just happened that Chad Dollahite, he's a graduate of the school. He was working half time and he was an associate preacher. And we got to know each other and we were just in the right place at the right time when GBN started plenty of great gospel preachers, more wise and great ability than I to be on television, but it just suit me, suited me. And I'm thankful for that opportunity, not only just to be able to proclaim the gospel, but also to get to know older preachers who really helped me. So hobbies, back to that quickly. My first hobby is art. I've always loved drawing and I've always loved uh, the visual media. And so what is the connection to that is I love writing. I love pens. Um, right now with me in this nice little leather case uh, are pens that are my favorite. And my favorite is fountain pens. Some of you are old enough to remember those. Uh, but they've had a resurgence. They really have. Uh, and so I'm in the process still of learning uh, Spencerian script. That's the handwriting of the Constitution, which is really neat. Um, my other hobby would be uh, sports. My favorite sport is boxing. I'll enjoy watching that. And then technology. I just love anything with that. Um, it always surprises people when they get on my Instagram. There are very few things there about the Bible. <laughs> and, and that I say that because going back to preaching full time, I never realized how much counseling I would do. And I'm sure these men have had some experience with that. And I found that as people came to my office and wanting marriage counseling or counseling as parents or just counseling as uh, life issues, I would take that home every night every day and it was affecting my spirituality and, and so I talked to the elders at the time and I just said look I need a break I can't do any counseling and so for a whole year I went and got some counseling myself and one of the things that uh, the very talented lady that I went to said you need something to totally separate yourself from what you do this is your life right and she understood that I said I'm a preacher this is what I do 24 hours a day but she says, you need some time to take that hat off. And because if something happens to you, then who's going to do it? And she's right. And so that's why these hobbies and, and things that are positive and good really help you to have some escape. So if you go on my Instagram account, it's got my name on it. You'll find pins, you'll find cologne, you'll find all kinds of things. <laughs> um, but you won't see that area as a preacher. And I think that's important. Lastly, um, favorite text would be one that maybe you don't think of often. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. And that is, in the American Standard Version, no soldier in active service entangleth himself in the affairs of this life that he may please the one who has enrolled him as a soldier. 
There Paul is encouraging Timothy in the faith, in the setting of training men, but also an important idea about where our life is to be. And that's something, as a new Christian, it's one of the first verses that I remember understanding and connecting to, part of my background being in the military. But it's the fact that we are dedicated to one purpose, one purpose only, and that is to glorify God. All the other things in our life are just secondary to that. What would I encourage seniors with? I would say this. Remember that although your physical body may have experienced the effects of time, your mind has not. Your mind is just as young, it's just as sharp as if you were 20 years old. And that's something that you have to serve and to give to others. Now, as long as some of y'all are meant, well, I don't remember like that. <laughs> but really, if you close your eyes and you see yourself, you don't see those outer, outward changes. You don't see how you feel or your energy level. You think about yourself as you always have. And that's a blessing, not just to pass on. And I hope you do that. Find some young people to really get to know because they need to appreciate. The brother that taught me the gospel was 20 years older than I was at the time I met him. I was 23. He was 43, um, but he just had an a, a, a extraordinary level of energy and, and work ethic and, and just did some things that are exceptional for a man his age at the time. But even as he's gotten older, still the same. And that's a lesson to us. Don't think your work is done. I think Brother DeVaris referred to that. It's not. There's still great work for you to do. You are not the church of the past. You are the church of the present. And so you are of great value. You are of great uh, usefulness and service to God. And so don't be discouraged because we know in our society, we just don't honor our older folks the way we ought to. Uh, but that's one of the things that I remember growing up, and that was respecting our older folks and always saying there's something you can listen and you can learn from. But that's a two-way street. You've got to find someone younger to pour yourself into. I know if you do that, you'll encourage them, and you might just encourage yourself along the way. Say the best for luck. Can you hear it? Okay. Okay. I'm assuming it's good. Good to see you. And I, I believe that I have... This is your personal stand, isn't it? <laughs> so this needs to be about right here. Could you hold this for me? Well, I'm just going to guard my Who? silverware. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, well. You know, I, I, I've already talked to you about my hype before when I was here. <clears throat> I always have a comeback when people talk about my height. And... I, just this past week, I had to go to the dentist. I broke a tooth, and, and it was the first time I'd ever been to him. And he was short, uh, about like him, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was, and he, when I sat in that chair, my, my feet hung way off. The, the, the nurse had to, you know, step around me every time she went. And so he said, how tall are you, and did you play basketball? <laughs> And that's the setup. And, and I said, well, I'm, I'm six, seven. And yes, I did. And I said, could I ask you if you played miniature golf? <laughs> Life lesson. Don't insult a dentist before he works on you. I, I will never do that again. Uh, well, I grew up in Chester, West Virginia. Uh, I, I said last night, I spent my whole life there. Uh, growing up. My dad preached for uh, 50 years in that congregation. He 60 plus years preaching total. And um, Chester probably means nothing to you because, uh, uh, well, it's like uh, if you said Midland, Texas, I wouldn't know if that's, you know, I, I, I know nothing of the geography here. And I'm sure you don't know anything about uh, West Virginia much. But Usually, when you say West Virginia, people think and associate it as a southern state, and I, I suppose it is listed as that, but uh, Chester, there's a panhandle in the northern part of West Virginia that juts up between Pennsylvania and Ohio. I could get to uh, Lake Erie in about an hour. 
Uh, the, the latitude of Chester is the same as New York City, uh, to give you some bearing as to the, you know, the location of that city. Um, and if you've ever heard of Alexander Campbell uh, and Bethany, uh, I lived, I grew up about uh, 30 miles north of Bethany. So uh, that, that's where I grew up and all my childhood memories are in that town and I uh, wouldn't trade it for anything. It was just a, a small town of about 3,000 folks. Uh, we were about 25 miles north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I'm a huge Steelers fan and talking about hobbies, that's, that's one of mine and I know that doesn't fly down here, does it? <laughs> uh, but uh, the Steelers uh, uh, are my team. But um, <clears throat> some of the things, uh, you asked about hobbies, well, family. Um, growing up, I had two sisters and myself. Uh, and I mentioned last night, um, I had a sister that died when she was nine. Today was, would have been her birthday. I have a sister that is four years older than me, and she's married to a preacher in uh, West Virginia. And then my dad passed away four years ago. My mom is living with my sister now in West Virginia. And uh, so in two weeks, I hold a meeting up there uh, and speak on the West Virginia School of Preaching lectureship back-to-back uh, -back up there, and I'm going to be staying with them uh, during that week, so it'll be a good time to be able to visit with my mom. One of the things, and I don't remember, it may have been Wayne that said it, uh, preachers have very little time with family. Um, I've spent one Mother's Day with my mother in, in maybe the last 33 years because I'm expected to be where I am to preach those sermons that you all like to hear on Mother's Day. And, uh, and my mom is sitting in a pew by herself. Uh, but before I moved to Carnes, I had uh, one day I said, I'm going to see my mom. And uh, I'd already decided I was moving to Carnes, so if they wanted to fire me, they could, you know. Uh, but I, I spent a Mother's Day there. Um, let, me, let me tell you about some of my hobbies. Um, <clears throat> I like sports, any sports. I'm a Penguins fan in hockey. I'm a Steelers fan. Well, you can just go down Pittsburgh. I, I like it. Uh, the Pirates, uh, the lowly Pirates. Um, I wanted a T-shirt. I never did buy it, but they, they sell these T-shirts up at Pittsburgh. It says, Pittsburgh, the city of champions, and it has... Uh, you know, pictures of the Steelers and the Penguins and all this. And then it says, Pittsburgh, the city of champions and the Pirates too, you know. <laughs> uh, it, it's been rough for a while, but back in the 70s, they were pretty good. Um, my hobbies also, Andy Griffith. Man, I'm a trivia buff of Andy Griffith. If you want to test me, go ahead. Uh, my wife and I both like it. And there's a guy that's a member of the church where I preach, and he has a squad car. Um, so my wife and I will go on dates, take the squad car, and, and go out. And uh, there's actually a duck pond in Knoxville, and we'll park at the duck pond just to say we parked at the duck pond. Um, so uh, I, I like that. My office, if you go in, uh, do you remember the Haunted House episode of Andy Griffith where there's that picture on the wall with those eyes that follow you? I've got that picture in my office, and it's about that tall and that wide. It's Old Man Remshaw was his name. And when people come into my office to talk to me, they'll sit there <laughs> and they'll think, and they'll eventually, is that family? It's like, no, no. So, but I have, it looks like Mayberry uh, got sick and just... Uh, <laughs> deposited a bunch of stuff in there. Um, my favorite memories <clears throat> when I was little, and this is, this is one that when I think of, uh, I, l I can remember so much about my childhood. My wife can't, but I, can rem I can't remember what happened yesterday, but I remember everything about being a kid. And one of the things that has stuck with me, and it tells me and reminds me of the, the ethic that my, my parents instilled in me, when I was probably mm, seven or eight years old, I wanted, I, there was a little drug store a couple blocks down the road. We felt free to go a couple blocks, you know, by yourself when you were little like that. 
back in the day. And, and I would go to this drugstore, and there was this display, a round display, and it had those matchbox cars in it. You could pull them out. There was this red dragster that I wanted. Man, it was beautiful. I wanted that car. And I pulled out my change, and I saw it said 89 cents. And I, I got my change, and I went up there to pay for it. And she charged me 50 cents. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> And I went home and I tried to play with that car and like I couldn't. I felt so guilty. I felt like I ripped off the store 30 cents. And, I, and I, as much as I tried, I could not play with that car. It was my favorite car, but there it sat and I never used it. So I said, I've got to do something about this. And I got 30 cents and I went back to Hershey's drugstore and I stood at the counter and just kind of waited around until finally that woman left and I laid my 30 cents down and ran out of the store <laughs> and I ran home and man, I played with that car. <laughs> I wore the front wheels off of it. And today, that car sits on my desk in front of my computer monitor and, and I leave it there to remind me to be a person of integrity. Uh, you know, every day you're faced with choices. The phone rings and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at my car when I'm talking to people on the phone. Um, you know, you get, to, it's so easy to uh, lose perspective and to forget who you are. And so I, I still have that little red uh, matchbox cars. It's missing the front wheels, but it's sitting right on my desk, right in front of me. Uh, it, it, is a reminder to me uh, to keep my integrity. One of my more favorite memories of my own kids is uh, my daughter, Anne-Marie. She's our youngest. She's a senior in high school right now. <clears throat> but uh, when she was maybe five or six, uh, we were at camp. The week before, my wife had been to Missouri to visit her mom and dad. And then Anne-Marie went to camp and so she's been like basically two weeks without her mom. And uh, I had a knock on the door about midnight and uh, the, one of the ladies said, uh, Anne Marie's crying, she's homesick. Um, and I said, well, I'll just, I'll take her home. Camp was about 30 miles from home. Uh, all week long during the camp, I had the job of doing the devotionals. And what I was trying to instill was this idea of Acts 10, 38, Jesus went about doing good. And I wanted to impress upon them every devotional that I gave that week was just go do good. Be like Jesus and do good. And uh, so it was midnight and I was more than ready to go home and have a nice night in my own bed. Uh, those beds at camp are usually pretty rough for somebody my, my height. We, I, 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 I'll tell you this. I went on a mission trip and, and my, the guy that was my roommate was about his <laughs> shorter than him actually. And he had so much room and my feet were hanging off and people said, well, how did, how did it go? And I said, it went fine. We put our beds together end to end because he didn't need all his and I, <laughs> I used the rest of his. But um, anyway, so, so we, uh, we went home that night and I was awakened the next morning by my daughter and she, she kicked the door open and she has hands full. She has uh, Cheerios, a bowl of Cheerios. And she brings one to me as I'm in bed, and I'm just thinking, oh, great. She walked up the stairs with two bowls of Cheerios <laughs> with milk. I'm going to have cleanup to do. And she took another bowl to her older sister down the hall. And then she ran back in room and jumped in bed with me. And I said, Emory, why? You've never fixed me breakfast in bed before. Why did, why did you do that? And she said, well, Dad, I've been hearing you say all week that we need to go about and do good. Um, and I just want to be like Jesus. And so I did good. And um, man, I'll tell you, uh, I've eaten in some swanky places before, but I've never had a better breakfast. You know, just that uh, bowl of Cheerios and milk. Uh, so that's, uh, and, and there's so many, you know, there's just so many memories. Uh, but those are, those are a couple of my favorites. My favorite scripture, uh, mine, I think, would be Hebrews 6.10. God is not unjust 
to forget our labor of love that we give to the Lord or on behalf of the Lord in that we minister to the saints and we do minister. You see, here's, and, and this leads into the whole idea, the last part, any encouragement you'd like to give to the seniors. We get in trouble not because we say, hey, you know what, I found truth elsewhere. I, I found that we're not teaching the truth and I found it over here and we leave because of that. that's not what's going on. But I know a lot of people that are no longer among us because they've grown weary. They've given up. They've gotten tired. And um, the, the thing, see, and even in preaching, you, you do so many things. You go out of your way, and as you do as well, as a child of God. Um, and, and what are you met with? Criticism? You didn't do it well. Or you didn't do it the way you should have done it. Or you, you, you go out of your way and you do something, and, and somebody doesn't even, th- they don't even say thank you. You know, they just take it for granted. And, and there are people that treat you, mistreat you. You, you. you break your neck trying to help them, and then they don't help themselves. And, and you do all these things, and sometimes you go, what's, what's the use? Man, I'm so tired of this. Uh, no one pays attention. No one cares. No one this and that. Listen to the first part of that verse. God is not unjust to forget your labor of love. The things that we do may never be appreciated by anybody else here on this earth. They may treat it with disrespect and despise us for it. But God's not that way. And, and he will reward us accordingly. And, and that's the point. I want to close with this and give you an illustration of it. But I love the Olympics. Eric Mozambani. Probably have never heard of him. But Eric Mozambani was in the 2000 Olympics and um, it's Sydney, Australia, and he was a swimmer. He was from Equatorial Guinea. And the way he trained, <clears throat> well, his nation was given a special dispensation to allow him to compete. They were underprivileged, uh, otherwise he never would have qualified. But here's the way he trained. He said, I swam in the ocean. He was a 100 meter swimmer. You'd swim the length of the pool and back. It's just a sprint. Um, He said, I would swim and train in the ocean if I had people to watch for crocodiles. Or I would uh, swim at a hotel swimming pool that was outside if it had rained enough to where there was water enough to... That's how he trained. Okay, so you have eight lanes in a pool. And you have, you know, these eight go and they, the time trials. And they kept going until there were just, there were three left. And it was Eric Mozambani and two other guys. And so they got up on that platform that they jump off into. And the other two guys jump in before the, the gun sounds. So that's a fault. They had to all get back up on the stand. Now, if you double fault, you're out of the race. You know what? Those two guys jumped in early again. And so now it's just Eric Mozambani who is going to swim in front of the entire Olympic audience. He's the only one in the pool. And so off he goes. He jumps in and he's making it. And um, he gets to the other end. And have you seen those guys, how they, they get to the end, they do that flip and push off and come back? Oh, man, he couldn't do it. You know, he, he, he looked like he was going to drown right there. Uh, but, but he pushes off, and, and he starts back, and he gets tired. You know, later, after the race was over, he said, I never really had swam that far without stopping and resting before because he had never done, had never had that kind of a pool, that length. And, but he said, you know, as I, I got closer and closer, uh, I could hear the crowd. And they were cheering for me. And, uh, you know, I couldn't stop. One of the commentators said of him after he, that race, he said he looked more like an energetic drowner than he did an Olympic <laughs> swimmer. Uh, you know, and, and that's uh, probably true. I've, I've looked at the video of his uh, race. But after he finished, he finished two minutes behind the, the uh, gold medal winner. Two minutes, that's a long time. 
he was that bad, but he finished. And when he was interviewed afterwards, he said, well, I couldn't stop because I heard all that applause and it was for me. And with all that encouragement, I had to finish. And that's what I'm telling you. You know, the, the older we get, the closer we are to the finish line. Don't throw it away now. If you look more like an energetic drowner finishing up your life, well, go ahead and flounder, but don't quit. Um, because, uh, you know, the, there's too much at stake. And, and the things that tend to discourage us and make us grow weary, those are the things that Hebrews 6 and verse 10 talk about. He said, uh, God is not unjust to forget your labor of love. Knowing that, there's nothing that can discourage me. I I'm going to finish. And, and I hope that uh, you will too. I appreciate your, your attention.